Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Julie Murphy, and I manage the lecture series for the Mariners Museum and Park. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jeremy Moss, a native of Chesapeake, Virginia, not far from our museum. Jeremy is now an accomplished lawyer and lobbyist living in Alexandria, Virginia. But he's in and out of Hampton Roads a lot, doing research and speaking as well. And we're thrilled to have him here today. His focus in his writing is on piracy, the golden age of piracy and early colonial maritime history, which is of great interest to all of us at the Mariners Museum because our mission is to connect people through the world's waterways. And that's the way we are all connected to one another. So I'm sure Jeremy's gonna share how Hampton Roads history and waterways played a part in his talk today. When he's not writing and researching, he is a very busy dad, a father of three young sons, and they enjoy his tales of piracy and uh, pirate speak and arg and all those fun things that, uh, that all of us children of all ages, including myself do. Uh, he is the author of the book that we will hear from today, The Life and Trials of the Gentleman Pirate, Major Steed Bonnet. And he is a, a, um, a, of Scott, Scott origin, I was interested to know. I had no idea. I thought it was Bonnet, like French. But anyway, he's a Scott. Um, we can't wait to hear more about the golden age of pirates, Blackbeard, the plying of Hampton Roads waters from Cape Charles to wherever Jeremy's going to share. And I'm going to turn it over now to author, attorney, father, and friend of the Mariners Museum, Jeremy Moss. This is great. Thank you for that introduction, Julie. Uh, I hope that you all can hear me well. As, as was mentioned, my name is Jeremy R. R. Moss. Um, I like to use, use my pirate speak whenever I can. Um, it, it always makes the storytelling a little bit better, particularly when I talk to, to my sons and the younger audiences. Um, as was mentioned, I am a native of Chesapeake, Virginia. I now live in Alexandria, Virginia, as I mentioned in the chat box a moment ago. And although I am many things, an attorney, lobbyist, philanthropist, author, freelance historian, I really do consider myself first a, a husband and father of three young sons, five, three and one years old. In our hour together today, I hope to bring to life uh, the golden age of piracy mostly through the lens of a particular pirate who I have an affinity for and who I wrote my first book about, The Life and Trials of the Gentleman Pirate, Major Steed Bonnet. And Bonnet's story really has it all. It's got failed relationships, midlife crisis, politics. Um, it's got plunder, murder, trials, tribulation, the highest of highs, the lowest of lows. It also has excessive drinking and deep-rooted feelings of longing and isolation. And, you know, as I say that, it, it sounds a lot like living through the pandemic, doesn't it? Um, so it's a, it's a timely tale, even though it's several hundred years old. Uh, by the time we end our, or by the end of our time together, I hope to have ignited or reignited for some of you, your interest in the history and culture of the real pirates of the Caribbean, um, including of course, buried treasure, walking the plank, flying the Jolly Roger, some pirate speak and more. And all the while hope to weave in some of the connections to the history of Hampton Roads. So with that, uh, let's, let's set sail. You know, as a Chesapeake native, I now work full time as an attorney in Alexandria, but I've always loved a good tale. And three years ago, my family and I were living in Norfolk, Virginia. And on the weekends, uh, my young son and I would go on excursions to give my then pregnant wife, Katie, some quiet time alone. We'd usually split our time between the local library, Slover Library, for those that are in Norfolk, I see. Um, and if we were up early enough, we'd catch the sunrise on Virginia Beach. One of those days, we popped into one of my favorite coffee shops, uh, Three Ships Coffee in Virginia Beach, right there behind the WRV for those that are in the area. And Three Ships is a perfect spot for us, right? It's rustic and quaint, but it's vibrant to drown out the babbles of a one-year-old, for example. And it's full of really interesting paintings and pictures and models. That particular day, I, I thumbed through a book uh, there about local ghost stories called Haunted Virginia Beach and it included the history of another man other than Steve Bonnet who had haunted the waters of, of Virginia Beach in the early 1700s. Uh, this man was Edward Teach or Edward Thatch, but he's best known uh, by the moniker Blackbeard the Pirate. And we're gonna talk a lot about Blackbeard today. And I was fascinated with the stories and I realized at that time years ago that I'd been really ignorant to much of the history in Hampton Roads.
Following that day, I wanted to learn more, particularly about Blackbeard and the golden age of piracy, which ran from, as you can see here, about 1650 to 1730. And it's really kind of broken up into three periods I learned. The first, it's called the buccaneering period. This is approximately from 1650 to 1680, and it's mostly English and French seamen based in Jamaica or Tortuga that attacked the Spanish. And in fact, uh, even the word buccaneer has a French origin, uh, referred primarily to landsmen of French heritage who lived on the island Hispaniola, so Dominican Republic, uh, Cuba, and sustained themselves on meats, uh, mostly feral pig and cattle. And they would smoke these meats on wooden racks called boucans, which would make them uh, boucaniers, or as we use the word now, buccaneers. So that's right, those, those dastardly men, mm -hmm. uh, the buccaneers, uh, now the Tampa Bay football team, for example, are named after men who simply smoked meats on wooden racks. Following that time period uh, was what we call the pirate round. These are long distance voyages from the Americas all the way into the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea to mostly pirate on Muslim and East India Company targets. These pirates went long, long distances, uh, sometimes stopping in the large pirate settlement of Madagascar and had huge significant plunders, making some of them the richest pirates of all. Now, the, the period that we'll talk about most today came after the, the War of Spanish Succession. This really goes from about 1716 to about 1726, when uh, English sailors and privateers, essentially themselves pirates, but with formal permission uh, from an established government, they left unemployed by the end of, of the War of Spanish Succession, and they started to turn en masse to piracy in the Caribbean. Uh, these were mostly sailors and Navy men uh, who had specific skill sets, um, that is to, to be on ships and to attack others. And with the end of the war, uh, there was simply nowhere for them to go uh, to use these skills. So they turned privately to pirate, private, they turned privately to pirating. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we move forward. Now, what's interesting is that the more that I read, the more that I realized that most of the stories that we know today are just romanticized lore. They're based either on embellished contemporary histories uh, or on, you know, well-known pirate tales like Treasure Island that we know today. I was looking for more scholarly style research. And with the internet and the archiving work done by folks like the Mariner's Museum, um, the Library of Congress, and even the British History Museum online, I found that there was a treasure trove of correspondence between governors, commissions, customs officials, citizens, um, as well as trial transcripts, depositions, and other court related documents, which for an attorney like me were just fascinating. I dove headfirst into the life of Blackbeard and studied for, for a couple of years, uh, his contemporaries, including his early gang called the Flying Gang, uh, but consistently came across a little known but very interesting story of a pirate that carried the nickname, the Gentleman Pirate. And he, uh, in addition to his interesting nickname, he had the title of Major. Now let's talk a little bit about who, you know, who in the world is, is this Steed Bonnet? So Steed Bonnet was living the life by the age of 28. He was rich, he was married with the three children, and his family lived on a 400 acre estate on a lush Caribbean island. Now what's fascinating about Bonnet is eventually he left it all behind. We'll talk about why in a minute. And he became a pirate. In the early 1700s, Bonnet spent portions of his criminal career looting ships across the, the coast of Virginia. And Bonnet's true life pirate tales is the subject and inspiration of my book, uh, The Life and Trials of the Gentleman Pirate, Major Steed Bonnet. By 1688, when Steed Bonnet was born, Barbados in the Caribbean had matured into a wealthy society of sugar plant planters. Being the windwardmost island of the Caribbean, uh, this gave Barbados many advantages. From the east, they got early news reports from, from England, um, goods from Europe, and eventually slaves, laborers, and servants from Africa and elsewhere. Barbados also had a strategic military advantage as winds blew across the region from east to west making it very difficult yeah. for ships to approach from the West. Um, this created kind of a strategic military advantage and made it a very easily defensible area. Now, even so, early Barbadian settlers really struggled to kind of find viable money-making crops. And the island grew tobacco, cotton, indigo, mostly on small family farms. That is until the sugar revolution. Now the sugar revolution, as it's called, 
was a huge, momentous social, economic, political occasion in, in Barbados. And essentially the, bar, the elite in Barbados, like Steve Bonnet's great grandfather, his grandfather and father, they chose a form of sugar production that yielded huge levels of profit, but at significant social costs. So white settlers in particular established these large sugar, sugar cane plantations and they were cultivated or, or grown and, and um, the sugar was, was uh, harvested by oppressed laborers from West Africa, essentially slaves. And Barbados uh, for years was one of the earlier slave um, holding er areas in the Caribbean um, and also was one of the first to kind of formalize slave ownership. So in a lot of ways, Barbados is kind of set the stage even for American colonial slavery. Um, and, and with that, you know, has you know, impacted absolutely the trajectory of society and has created ripples that we feel even today socially. Now, Steve Bonnet's father would have managed the, the Bonnet family estate until his death in 1694. And at that time, Steed, who was born in 1688, was only six years old. So here we have Steed Bonnet, a six-year-old, um, with his mother, and shortly thereafter, Steed's mother would pass away too. And Steed, at the age of six, was an orphan, and the affairs of that estate was was taken care of Steed's by Steed's guardian until he reached adulthood. Now, young Steed inherited and was raised in this bustling estate, right? It's 400 acres of sugarcane fields, two windmills, a cattle-driven mill, three servants, likely indentured whites from e either England, Scotland, or Ireland, and 94 slaves. And as he reached adulthood, he took over full responsibility. But really from the age of six, Bonnet had tremendous wealth. This continued on into his adulthood. When Steed was 21 years old, he would marry Mary Allenby. Yeah. She was a 16 year old daughter of a fellow wealthy plantation owner and another member of the Barbadian aristocracy. And Steed and Mary would have four children, uh, three sons and a daughter. Steed's first son, Allenby Bonnet, would die in early childhood sometime before 1715. Now, well respected and part of the elite, Steed was appointed as a justice of the peace um, and as a slave owner, Bonnet participated in the militia of Barbados, responsible primarily for tracking down and returning escaped slaves. Uh, it was in this militia that Bonnet acquired his title of major, which was carried on throughout history. Now, like other wealthy gentlemen of Barbados, Steve may have been civil, generous, hospitable, probably very sociable. Um, and as plantation owners, Steed and Mary would have lived like little sovereigns on their plantation with full authority over whatever they liked to do. Uh, in short, the Bonnets and their neighbors lived as plentifully as anybody else in the world. They had everything necessary for life of respect, pomp, and even luxury. And even in the midst of such bounty, Bonnet did not adjust well to family life. It seems uh, less likely, though, that, that Bonnet's drive to piracy, as some historians would have proposed, was just the extra extravagance of a wealthy landowner and instead uh, was really part of um, something more. And that's really what I wanted to uncover as I started to research Bonnet in this book. You know, like I said, Bonnet didn't adjust well to family life. Um, Steed suffered as the author of General History of the Pirates published in 1724 described as some quote, discomforts he found in a marital state. <laughs> Basically, Bonnet had um, a nagging wife and a lot of marital strife. And it was through this uh, that, that ultimately caused Bonnet to go, as it says here, to have a humor to go a pirating. Now, the, the reasons for those discomforts are not well preserved. Um, historians will frequently quote that from, from a general history of pirates, but there's really not a lot of contemporary evidence of what was really happening in his marriage. You know, perhaps Steed's early life as an orphan carried with him some emotional baggage that was too much sustain, to sustain an already fragile marriage or perhaps the emotional stress of losing a child at an early age, you know, created issues for the marriage. Or finally, um, and this is really what's lacking in the historical discussion, is it's very possible that Steed and Mary Allenby had a difference of opinion about politics. And the contextual background really comes from what's called the Jacobite Revol Re Rebellion of 1715. You know, as it would become clear from future events, Steed Bonnet was what was called a Jacobite sympathizer and perhaps a supporter. 
Barbados, in fact, had a lot of Jacobite supporters, uh, mostly from Scotland, and, and Bonnet would have grown up on an island um, that some said had, quote, too many Jacobites uh, to really do anything good for the government or the king. It's unclear, though, what, what Mary's position would have been on who the rightful heir to the, the throne was. And if Allenby had supported George I, for example, uh, maybe Steed and Mary would have had a significant political divide between the two. But nonetheless, uh, by the end of 1716, 28-year-old Steed Bonnet had had enough of the good, good life and its discontents. Bonnet was struck with a humor to go a pirating. Now, what's interesting is Bonnet um, had a liberal education and unlike many at the time, um, he was quite literate and he was an apparently voracious reader with a fondness of books. And Bonnet may have found himself inspired by books like Voyage Narratives of the Time, um, A Voyage of the South Sea Round the World, for example, from 1712 by Captain Cook or a cruising voyage around the world written by Woods Rogers, who would later become the first royal governor of the Bahamas and a famed pirate hunter. Other narratives like Lionel Wafers, who we'll mention late, Wafer again later, um, or William Dampier's a, a New Voyage Around the World may have given Bonnet a little bit of wanderlust as well. These books combined, combined with tales of piracy and buccaneering shared across Barbados, uh, contained in the newspapers or potentially by word of mouth, uh, may have reminded Bonnet that he had a relatively sheltered lifestyle on the 166 square miles of Barbados. Romantic tales of treasure, adventure, and the immensity of the sea uh, may have caused Bonnet to long for something more, something more that he could find in that small island of Barbados. Now, in December of 1716, um, some events started to unfold that created um, kind of Bonnet's real trajectory towards piracy. In December of 1716, for example, a small Newport, Rhode Island based ship called the Revenge um, came into Barbados. And when the ship's owner was approached by a local plantation owner, Bonnet, who wished to purchase the ship, he wouldn't have thought twice about what his intentions were or what his experience in maritime affairs were. You see, Bonnet bought this ship outright paid cash for it, uh, perhaps with portion of a 1,700 pound or almost $400,000 loan he'd recently taken out. And he went about commissioning the local shipyard to fit out this 60 ton sloop at his own expense. Modifications were made to the ship um, to be sure that carried up to a dozen cannons and had room for 100 men. Um, and also to ensure that the ship, the sloop, uh, was equipped with the comforts of a man of his status would expect, including a full library of books uh, in his private quarters. Whether Bonnet explained the purchase to his wife, we, we simply don't know. Um, the, the record doesn't show. But Steed's purchase of the revenge may not have raised a lot of suspicion at all. You see, it wasn't uncommon for rich, wealthy men like, like Steed to have pleasure boats, to basically make a tour of the island in or to convey their goods uh, to and from Bridgetown in Barbados. But Bonnet was unique. He was, let, let's not get this wrong. He was a landsman. He had absolutely no understanding of maritime affairs at all. It's unclear whether he had even been on a ship before he bought the sloop. But he would have read um, about sloops and he would have understand that he needed to select the proper sloop if his intention was to leave, uh, to leave Barbados. Now, he had the sloop in hand, it was being fitted out, but to sail of revenge, Bonnet would have had to set about to find his own crew. And this is where it's really, really kind of funny. Um, the thought of Bonnet enlisting a crew is comical to me. So you've got Major Bonnet. He's got a fitted woolen overcoat, this tricorn or cocked hat is trimmed in gold. He's wearing a fashionable wig. He's got silk stockings um, and heeled leather pointed shoes with gold buckles. He would have stood out against um, the tanned salted men of the wharves, shipyards and taverns of Barbados. And while Bonnet may have found a number of eager crewmen um, yearning to answer the call of the sea, he probably encountered some resistance from among those, uh, those masses of men in Barbados as well. You see, being on a ship was not necessarily uh, luxurious at all. Uh, to, to quote Samuel Johnson, who compiled the first authoritative English dictionary, no man would be a sailor who has a contrivance enough to get himself into a jail for being in a ship is being in a jail with just the chance of drowning. That's right, uh, you, you get enclosed in this small space and, and it feels very much like a jail, but you've got the opportunity to drown. 
Now, Bonnet somehow managed to hire 126 men. He paid them a full wage out of his own fortune, which was uncommon at the time. Um, you see, pirates almost always took a piece of plunder, not a wage. He outfitted the ship, outfitted the revenge with six cannons and plenty of ammunition. And some of Bonnet's crew may have been holdovers, but others may have also been these unemployed sailors that we talked about earlier, uh, that were part of the war of Spanish succession uh, that left, left many sailors unemployed. Bonnet spent the early months of 1717 sorting out his affairs at home. Uh, in March, he had a power of attorney drawn up, appointing Mary and two of his friends to handle his personal affairs. And in either April or May of 1717, the record's not really clear, uh, Bonnet left the island of Barbados, left his wife, his three young children, and his newly born Mary um, under the cover of night to live out these piratical fantasies. Telling others that he was leading simply for a short trading voyage, Bonnet never returned, and he never saw his family again. In fact, he ignored the requirement that every ship get cleared by customs before leaving Barbados. And the record shows that the revenge was, quote, gone without clearing. Within the first hour of Bonnet's journey, Bonnet and the crew of the revenge had already broken the law. From Barbados, Bonnet was eager to leave his life behind quickly. He traveled north um, and was reported early on off the coast of Jamaica, Jamaica as he made his way to the American mainland and the colonies um, to the Capes of Virginia. And that's where he settled in to start between Cape Charles to the north, um, Make, marking the southern tip of Virginia's eastern shore and Cape Henry, 12 miles to the south, uh, in what we now know as Virginia Beach. This was the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay and Bonnet arrived there in June 1717. Now, even before Bonnet had arrived, uh, the Virginia Capes had been a popular destination among pirates. But as we'll discuss, the Virginia governors, unlike other colonial governors, had a certain disdain for pirates or sea rovers as they were called at the time. Um, this is an interesting map, and I'll just point this out here. Um, this is called the, the, the John Smith map of Virginia. Um, it was actually created by a gentleman named William Hull, but it's based on information provided by Smith and then published in 1612. And what, what's interesting is it shows, um, and it was drawn as maps of the time where it's intended for mariners. You see, it offers a seaman's perspective of the land. In other words, the water's at the bottom. So in that case, the west is at the top. At the beginning of the 18th century, right in the middle of the golden age of piracy, settlements in Virginia were still very much centered around the main waterways of the tidewater. This includes all of the bays, rivers, and creeks. And not long after the first permanent English colony in America at Jamestown, several smaller settlements started to form along the James River, including those at Point Comfort and Kickatan, um, which is now known as Hampton. Right around 1700, tidewater, also called Hampton Roads now, uh, was becoming a thickly populated with a prop approximately 80,000 people living in more than 20 counties. Counties at the time um, included very familiar names, James City County, New Kent, Charles City, Henrico. You've got Princess Anne, which is now Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Nansman, which now includes Suffolk and Isle of Wight, as well as um, Accomack and Northampton on the Eastern Shore. But in the early 1700s, Virginia really had no significant cities. We had Williamsburg, who had recently become the capital from Jamestown, and the town of Norfolk had been established. Uh, but we weren't seeing any walled cities or any with significant uh, forts. The boundaries were considered at the time to the north, the Potomac River, which still stands as, as our boundary. Uh, to the south, the settlement or the proprietary of South Carolina. To the east, we had the Atlantic Ocean, which was called the Virginia Sea. As you can see here on the map, the Sea of Virginia was listed. And on the west, the Californian Sea, which is now the Pacific. Um, Virginia's many rivers and creeks and coastline were actually very hard to defend. And smuggling was very, very easy since vessels could slip in and slip out uh, without paying the duty as they were required. For defense, we had a, a typical you know, scenario. We had guard ships that were stationed in the bay. We had a couple of forts. Uh, we had a militia who was land-based and we had lookouts that would kind of troll the beaches to detect and repel invaders. Now let's talk a little bit about setting the stage for the piracy that Bonnet would have in, in 1717. In the summer of 1682, Virginia experienced one of the first instances of piracy of any significance. 
Uh, during that summer, a pirate ship came into the Chesapeake Bay and dropped anchor at the mouth of the York River. Uh, the pirate crew got onto small boats, canoes, uh, made their way up to Tyndall's Point across from what's now known as Yorktown. When they arrived, the pirates entered and plundered two different houses. They basically um, broke into these houses and carried away a, a large number of goods, money, and silver plate. That's right, not all piracy occurred at sea. As you can imagine, this early instance of piracy alarmed the Council of Virginia, and the government made quick efforts uh, to try to prevent what they expected to be continued piracy along the bay. Uh, one of the colonels, Colonel William Cole, impressed or took uh, a private ship um, and started to give chase to these men. He gathered some militia, 12 barrels of pork, and he, he set off into the Chesapeake Bay. Eventually, the pirates were caught in Rhode Island. And of those pirates, five of them were returned to Virginia for trial. Now, those five men escaped. And uh, as you can imagine, the colony of Virginia at the time just you know, there were hues and crowds, cries throughout the colony. Yeah. Two of the pirates were eventually recaptured, three others disappeared forever, and they were charged on, on piracy, uh, charges of piracy, convicted and sentenced to be hung. Now, what's interesting about this early story is the pirates successfully petitioned um, for a two day reprieve yeah. from execution so that one of them could be baptized. And during those two days before execution, uh, the men escaped by removing two iron bars from the windows. Here's a representative example of what the ghoul or the, the, the jail that they were in would have looked like. And they removed a couple of the iron bars uh, and escaped. Now, several days later, somehow, um, three days later to be, to be more particular, um, the, the pirates actually snuck back into jail. They had done what they needed to do to prepare themselves for death um, and snuck back in the same way that they came out. Now, the inhabitants of Virginia were so impressed by the honesty of these two prisoners that they successfully petitioned the governor to pardon the men. And these two, uh, the remaining pirates of, of Tyndall's Point, um, were, were pardoned and were later set free. You know, in a similar way, um, in early June of 1688, there were three other pirates, John Henson, Edward Davis, and Lion of Wayfair. And they were arrested near Old Point Comfort in Hampton. They had three chests heavily laden with pieces of eight and big silver plate. This was a huge treasure that they had amassed when they were sailing the Pacific Ocean with William Dampier and others. Now for three years, uh, the seamen were, were stuck in jail and their treasure uh, was kept by the government. And finally, the, the, the three pirates had not made very much headway on getting their treasure back and they enlisted the legal services and influence of an attorney. Yeah. His name was Makaija Perry. Now, Barrister Perry uh, filed petitions in both Virginia and London to recover the chests and their contents. And eventually the three pirates traveled to London uh, to petition the monarchy for their release. While they were in London, uh, they met with Reverend James Blair. And for those of you in the Williamsburg area, that, that may be a familiar reference. You see, Blair was a well-known Virginian. Um, he was also well-known in London and he was off and on friends with Virginia Governor Francis Nicholson. Blair negotiated a pledge from the pirates for the construction of his new school in Virginia. And by a, a letter dated February, 1691, um, Blair wrote to King William and Queen Mary and said that he certified that the pirates had devoted um, almost 300 pounds, um, almost uh, several million dollars in today's dollars uh, for the free school and college in Virginia. That's right, uh, in February 1693, with a combination of the 300 pounds pledged by the pirates, uh, the college in William & Mary in Virginia was established. So it's important to note that, that Governor Nicholson, who was at the time very close to James Blair, was among a small group of very fervent pirate hunters and haters. This undoubtedly protected Virginia merchants from almost constant piracy, although it didn't stop it, but it protected us from it. Other states in the name primarily of commerce and politics had a more, we'll call it kind of progressive view of piracy. You see in Massachusetts, uh, pirates had been permitted to fit out expeditions. Um, Rhode Island had become a refuge and clearinghouse for pirate booty and plunder. Connecticut, um, whose governors were elected annually, tolerated pirates because they feared political opposition as part of the powerful merchant community. New York's governor, Benjamin Fletcher, his secretary, the collector of customs, and even the Royal Navy guard ship on station there was widely known to be in the league with pirates. Buccaneers would frequent the lonely coasts of New Jersey and Delaware, um, and 
the sparsely populated colonies of New York, excuse me, North and South Carolina were reported to be rapidly becoming pirate sanctuaries along the East Coast. But Virginia had remained for years um, quite free from piracy. And that really is until let's say 1699. In Ju July 1699, John James, a Welshman, um, who had given to wearing a gold toothpick on a chain around his neck and who was by all accounts one of the ugliest men you will ever have seen in the world. See, James uh, sailed his, his boat, the Providence Galley, into the Linhaven Bay in search of the sole British, British guard ship, the HMS Essex Prize, um, who James had learned from some information he'd gathered from another ship that he had taken was very weak. You see, James wanted to attack the Essex Prize and remove the only guard ship uh, in the Linhaven in the mouth of the Chesapeake to take her sails, her, her stores of goods, and then also the gunpowder from the ship. In a search, uh, James eventually found the Essex Prize and the pirates 26 guns and 130 uh, men uh, went after the Essex Prize, which only had 16 guns and 60 men. And wisely, Captain Aldred of the Essex Prize stayed at extreme cannon range. They circled each other for a long time. And then eventually Aldred tried to lure uh, the Essex Prize into more shallow water. Tiring of the dance, James casually captured a couple of merchant vessels and eventually sailed away unscathed, leaving the Essex Prize. But the repercussions resulted from the attack on Virginia were swift. It was obvious at the time that the governor, Francis Nicholson, um, to the governor, that more force and better protection was necessary. Uh, quickly, decrees were, were initiated and issued to the counties of Norfolk, Princess Anne, and Accomac, um, and there were coast watchers. So there would be one watcher on the coast that would march up and down the beach between Cape Henry and the Lynn Haven River, another between Cape Henry and the Curatek Inlet a third on the remote Smith's Island at the southern tip of the eastern shore, and a fourth directed to patrol uh, Northampton County. Despite these defensive measures, it became very clear that from the invasion uh, that Virginia had some vulnerability and that the coast was exposed. Here I'll show you the Lynn Haven. This is the area of the map that, we're, that we were talking about specifically. And as an aside, you know, although John Smith, we talked about his map from 1612, he assigned many of uh, the first English place names to places in Virginia. And most uh, had been given names that retain North American style names like the Chesapeake, for example. Um, but the Lynn Haven is a little bit different. You see Adam Thurgood, a name uh, that many people in Virginia Beach will recognize now. He was an early colonist, um, became a leading businessman and sheriff. He's credited with giving the Lynn Haven River his name. And you can see even in uh, 1651, when this map was created, Lynn Haven was starting to get um, its recognition. Um, Lynn being the word for pool or cascade or waterfall and Haven uh, simply means a place, a mouth, the mouth of a river inlet that provided shelter for ships. Now going back, uh, in early 1700, after uh, the Providence Galley had, had chased off the Essex Prize into the Lynn Haven River, um, another pirate, Louis Guitar, in fact, he was a buccaneer, uh, came into the, the okay. Chesapeake Bay um, with the understanding that there would be really no guardship in place. The Essex Prize, um, as we discussed earlier, had shown some weakness in previous battles and, and Guitar came into the Chesapeake thinking he was gonna have free reign of the Lynn Haven River. Now, what he didn't know is that the HMS Shoreham under the Captain William Passenger um, had recently arrived just a couple weeks earlier partially in response to John James looting a number of vessels. Now, after Guitar chased some remaining merchantmen into Lynn Haven Bay, um, Virginia Governor Francis Nicholson had had enough. Nicholson happened to be in Kickatan at the time and he got onto passenger ship, uh, the Shoreham, and he reportedly stood on the foredeck uh, as they went down into the Lynn Haven River to chase off Louis Guitar and his ship La Pays. Although they were evenly matched, you see passenger had 115 crew members and 28 guns and guitar had a crew of 150 or 160. Um, guitar was forced to surrender after a 12 hour battle in the Lynn Haven River. Now think about this, the Lynn Haven, which is relatively small. Um, so as you go over the Lesnar Bridge and Virginia Beach headed toward the North End or towards First Landing, 
um, there were seven, 1,671 cannonballs fired, um, hundreds of weight of small arm, arms fire between the two ships, 27 barrels of gunpowder. Um, so just a huge, huge naval battle right there in the Lynn Haven River. 40 pirates were killed and the rest were captured, uh, eventually shipped off to, to London for trial. So it was under this, this history and this pretense um, that Bonnet arrived in Virginia in 1717. And after arriving in Virginia, Bonnet had relatively early success. It was his first cruise, but he plundered several ships and he took from them things like provisions, clothes, money, ammunition. Uh, you see, he had been at sea for several months and his food stores would have become low. Um, you, you know, his, his fresh fruit, for example, would have been yeah. taken, all of his meats, except for those that may have been, may have been smoked. Um, and even staples like flour and beans were typical, difficult to keep on board because of the wet, salty conditions. His fresh water, those stored in casks, were always prone to developing algae or mold. And rum and wine stores, which held up well against the elements, uh, didn't necessarily hold up well, you know, with 110 men aboard. They would have access to pickled vegetables or salted meats or dry biscuits, hard biscuits, but it would have been several weeks into his voyage and Bonnet would have had trouble keeping those on board. So it was important, like many pirates, um, to, to start to take smaller ships and take these types of provisions. Now, like many pirates of the time, Bonnet and his crew did not frequently engage in full-fledged sea battles. Um, in fact, Bonnet's most significant ships or most significant battles um, did not end well for Bonnet. No, Bonnet would, like others, other pirates, he'd typically fire a warning shot across the bow of a ship, fly as Jolly Roger, which we'll talk about in a second, to garner a surrender. Once they had surrendered, uh, the captain of the quartermaster would typically interrogate members of the crew. Um, it could be especially harsh to captains who were cruel to their sail sailors. But um, despite what pirate lore says, it says Bonnet's alleged to have been one of the few pirates to make his prisoners walk the plank, for example. There's really no contemporary source that makes any mention of Bonnet or really anyone else uh, forcing pirates or their prisoners to walk the plank. And I would agree uh, with most modern scholars that studies the golden age of piracy that walking the plank was really rare. And it's probably reserved later, probably a hundred years later um, to mutinies or other issues that happened on the ship, not necessarily with the captives. In fact, the gentleman pirate uh, would have routinely treated his captives with respect. Um, but he, he did, in his first few days, he did engage in the routine burning of, of ships, particularly those that he captured that were out of Barbados, uh, presumably either to mask or shield his identity or to extract revenge on Barbados, a place that he had grown to hate. Now here I've got the many flags of Steve Bonnet. You see the traditional depiction of, of Bonnet's flag, which includes in the top left, a, a white skull, a, a long horizontal bone between a heart and a dagger. Um, these show up in my, modern day pirate literature, but there's no known contemporary source that describes anything similar. Most of what we heard was simply that Bonnet flew what was called a bloody flag or a red flag, the top right corner. Um, this is what was really the true Jolly Roger. You see, Jolly Roger is derived from the French Jolie Rouge, which means pretty red. The red flag was typically used to indicate that no quarter would be given, meaning that pirates would take no prisoners. This would scare captains of ships um, and, and sometimes force them into a sea battle, for example. On the bottom left is the flag uh, that's depicted in a general history of pirates. So in 1724, there was a wood carving of Steed Bonnet, and this is the flag that shows up in that, that wood carving. Um, Steed Bonnet's death head flag um, is in the bottom right. This is what was described in the Boston Newsletter, a contemporary um, newspaper at the time, which had a report of Bonnet flying this death heads flag along his, his pursuit of, of another ship. Now, as was typical from at, of the time, Bonnet may have regulated either formally or informally the plunder that was taken uh, during some of his, his early works. So things like gold rings, for example, arms, books, instruments, clothing, um, all of that would have been plundered, specifically dictated uh, by what are called articles. You see, a group of pirates would drop their own articles, uh, which had rules for discipline, the division of stolen goods, or even compensation for injured pirates. 
That's right. They actually had a workers' compensation policy for people that would be hurt at sea. In other circumstances, like we probably had with Bonnet, who paid a wage, um, the pirate articles were likely drawn up by the captain himself. And each crew member was asked to sign or make his mark on the articles and then swear an allegiance. This might happen on a Bible if it was available. With Bonnet's library, I suspect that one probably would be. Uh, but there are recorded instances of the crew swearing on an axe, some crossed pistols, or even a human skull. Um, there are nine complete or nearly complete sets of pirate articles that have survived. Most of those come from a general history of the pirates from 1724. Although there are a number that come from the records kept by the Admiralty Court proceedings of the trials of pirates. Um, there's an early known partial code of Henry Morgan, a famous Captain Morgan, um, that's preserved in the 17, six, excuse me, 1678 book, The Buccaneers of America. Now let's talk a little bit about early Hampton Roads. You see here, uh, Newport News, as you can see with this yellow dot is where the Mariner's Museum is, for yeah. example. And Bonnet would have likely taken advantage of the Virginia Beach topography as he captured his prizes. Here you've got Cape Charles to the north, Cape Henry to the south. Um, and just west of Cape Henry, you've got the Lynn Haven Roads. These are essentially the areas that lead into the Lynn Haven River into its estuaries. Uh, you also have the Pleasure House, of which was a local tavern or gambling house popular among the pirates. This is located in, in Chicks Beach or what we call Chesapeake Beach as well, uh, right next to where Route 13 entrance for the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel is. Um, and you see this Pleasure House would have been a tavern. Um, probably for gambling. There are some local lore that this could be a place of ill repute, maybe um, you know, like, a, like a, a harem or, a, or something else. But the reality is I don't think that the Anglican uh, religion at the time would have allowed anything more than a place to just drink. Here we've got uh, the area of Hampton, um, including Kickatan and Point Comfort. And up here at the top of the map, you've got Jamestown and Williamsburg as well. Now to Lynn Haven specifically, for those that are based in Virginia Beach or know the area, um, you've got a couple of things. The first, you've got uh, the Lynn Haven Roads, which lead into the Lynn Haven River and its estuaries, the Lynn Haven Bay. And during the 1700s, what is now Lake Joyce, uh, here to the left of the screen, would have been part of a continuous waterway all the way from Little Creek to the Lynn Haven River. And you can still see remnants of where that would have been um, before some of the hurricanes have hit since then to wash over those. And then located within those islands um, remains a small island and breast where a small breastwork was yeah. built, apparently by pirates. Um, this, this fort called Pirates Fort or Blackbeard's Fort, Blackbeard's Island, would have had a, a vantage point um, for several higher dunes along Cape Henry, with some dunes up to 50 feet. And what's now known as First Landing State Park has a dune that's as high as 80 feet. So basically, the pirates would sail into what is now Lake Joyce. They could possibly hang out here and near what's now Blackbeard's Island um, and look out for sentinels that were placed in these dunes um, to, to let them know when there are sails along the Atlantic horizon coming into the Chesapeake Bay. And with a signal, the ship that was anchored in, in Lake Joyce would have triggered the pirates to ready themselves and across the approaching vessel. It's really interesting, areas in this neighborhood um, still have adopted pirate names like Blackbeard Road, Treasure Island Road, Bounty Road, Sea Chest Road, and even John Silver Road. So as you travel along Shore Drive, right in front of where the Taste is, um, which is, I think, near Bayville, Bayville Park, um, you can see, you know, a, a lot of these areas still. And that island is now privately held. Somebody owns it. Yeah. So Bonnet had some early success, uh, but as, as he left Virginia, um, his inexperience would be evident. You see, first he went up to New York um, and he did some trading in a place called Gardner's Island, which is a location of one of the very few buried treasures um, that we know of where Captain Kidd where, would have buried his treasure before he met the governor of New York. Um, and you see buried treasure was an exception, not the rule. I like to think about it like this. A buried treasure would have been like a pirate's 401k, right? It's a retirement savings. I'm gonna put my money here, my treasure here, and I'm gonna come back to it. There's two things wrong with that. The first is most of the wealth for many pirates like Bonnet was not always in gold or silver. A lot of it came in uh, provisions, things that had to be sold or traded. Um, and then also, you know, pirates didn't expect to have very long lives. You know, the business that they were in, they weren't planning for the future. 
So having this pirate 401k, for example, probably wasn't on high, high on their list of concerns. For time after leaving Gardner's and a stint outside of Charlestown, which is now Charleston, South Carolina, the crew of the Revenge was obviously confused and lost. Bonnet offered very little, if any, uh, leadership. And it was, despite his early success, his inexperience was quite obvious. So as was typical of the time, Bonnet held a vote uh, and the crew said, where are we, where are we gonna go? And um, the, eventually they really had no resolution. They decided that they were gonna go toward the Straits of Florida and the site of what was called the Spanish Rex. You see in 1715, only two years before Bonnet's arrival in Florida, uh, there was a huge 11 ship Spanish treasure fleet that had embar embarked from Havana, bound all the way for Cadiz in Spain. Several years to, for several years before their departure, uh, since the start of the war, the Spanish had not really moved large quantities of silver, gold, and jewels from Mexico and South America back to Spain. But with the end of the war, the Spanish governor, government had a need for silver and gold to fund the war efforts and put together this, this fleet full la laden with, with treasure um, to, to send it back to, to Spain. There was almost a comedy of errors though, and the late summer storm just destroyed this fleet, wrecking ships and spreading their contents for miles. As you can see from this picture here, the ships actually crashed, many of them, very close uh, to Florida. And for years, vessels from all over the Caribbean and particularly those English speaking colonies would fit out themselves to go fish on these Spanish wrecks. And by mid-September 1717, uh, the revenge had made their way down to do the same. Now, as they arrived, uh, a lookout spotted a very large merchant ship flying Spanish colors. It was within striking distance of the much smaller revenge. Now, apparently emboldened by his early success or maybe by his ignorance, um, Bonnet must have thought that he could capture and plunder this much larger vessel, which may have some treasure on it. Although it's not uncommon, um, Bonnet would show his true colors. Uh, basically, he would throw up his Jolly Roger and all of a sudden he would be engaged with the much larger vessel. What they quickly realized is that this was not some heavily laden Spanish merchant. In fact, this was a large Spanish man of war, likely sent to patrol these Spanish wrecks. Um, and Bonnet's moment of reflection on where he was in life must have been shattered as the Spanish guns were the first to fire. This larger ship volleyed a huge violent broadside on the Revenge. Um, they turned quickly to the Revenge's stern and unleashed another round of cannon fire. At this point, the, the smaller Revenge was now engaged in a bloody battle. And Bonnet, who was injured by the initial broadside and dozens of other men were killed and wounded. A few able-bodied men remaining um, were able to flee from the much larger vessel and get the unconscious Bonnet below deck and into his quarters. This is really where Bonnet's story took a turn. And when the, the crew of the Revenge arrived in Nassau, which was a resort for pirates at the time, Bonnet couldn't himself known uh, the impact of his early arrival. Yeah. You see, it was here in Nassau that Bonnet's legacy would be forever connected with that of Edward Teach, also known as Blackbeard. And although it was unlikely that uh, that he was ever had been met before, uh, Bonnet was described, or excuse me, Teach or Blackbeard was described as a good sailor, uh, a most cruel hardened villain, basically exactly the opposite of what the softer, um, richer Bonnet would have been. Now Teach was known for his remarkably ugly Blackbeard, uh, which is how he got his nickname. And he had also been sailing around the Caribbean with a group known as the Flying Gang. Sometime during that period, as, as Bonnet started to, uh, to, to, to get better, he and Blackbeard would connect. And it's unclear from the record why. I, I would think that it's because Bonnet had something that Blackbeard wanted, which was a ship full of men that needed a captain. And Blackbeard had something that, that Bonnet really wanted, which is a captain to take over his ship. And by the end of September, uh, the Revenge uh, was captained by Blackbeard. He had taken over the ship and basically uh, Bonnet himself was simply um, a passenger on the ship. They would go back to the Capes of Virginia, go through uh, Delaware and take over dozens and dozens of prizes with Blackbeard on board. And it was at this time that Bonnet would have seen what it was really like to be um, on, a, on a real pirate ship. You see, Teach would terrorize his targets. He wore slings of guns over his shoulders and he would light tiny little 
uh, fuses or matches in his hair, causing smoke to kind of envelop his head and shoulders and body, really trying to create this, this terrorizing image. He had really wild eyes that were fierce and wild. And every time he would get on a ship, people would just be in awe. Frequently, um, Bonnet, for example, this plump gentleman, um, you know, would, would just look at, at, at Blackbeard, who almost never had to engage in an actual naval battle. Nonetheless, at some point, Black, or excuse me, Bonnet would be helpless to change his fate. Um, he was stuck. He was known to, he was helpless to change his fate of piracy, and he would always have to sail with Blackbeard. Now the book, um, and I'd encourage you to check out this part, discusses almost every naval battle that they had while they were aboard the Revenge, both Bonnet and Blackbeard together. And the working relationship just kind of grew complicated over time. Um, I think it became obvious that, that Bonnet was inexperienced. Um, and I think Blackbeard simply just lost interest in sailing together. And there was two instances where they separated and came back together. Eventually, um, they would have taken advantage of what's called the act of grace. Now, in, in September of 1717, the King of England realized very quickly that pirates had to be suppressed. There had to be a way to encourage pirates uh, to stop doing what they were doing. So to do this, they had what's called the King's Pardon or an Act of Grace um, that essentially allowed pirate captains to pardon themselves. But what this act said is if they failed to do so, um, there would be a, sig a, a significant um, ransom for people to, to chase pirates down. Essentially what the king tried to do is said, look, this is your last chance. If you don't pardon yourselves, we're gonna come after you with everything that we have. So Bonnet and Blackbeard took advantage of that. They, they uh, took their ships into North Carolina um, where they met with Governor Eden separately. In fact, yeah. um, while, while Bonnet was, was getting his pardon, Blackbeard is, had probably purposefully uh, ran his ship aground. Bonnet met with Eden, he goes back to meet with Blackbeard and he realized that he has been tricked. Um, he finds that Blackbeard and his crew, um, he had robbed the revenge, taken the other vessels and sailed away with almost all the loot. So Bonnet now was in sole command of his revenge. He had few, if any of his original crew members um, and he had to go reinforce his, himself by rescuing a few men who had been marooned on a sandbar nearby. When he met with Eden, Eden, Governor Eden, Bonnet told Black, or excuse me, got, Bonnet told the governor that he intended to go to St. Thomas and try to get a letter of mark um, to, to hunt the French and the Spanish again, stay away from the English, for example. Now, St. Thomas was in the midst of the hurricane season and Bonnet couldn't go there for several months. So to preserve his pardon, Bonnet, Bonnet was um, taking other ships and trying to get provisions to, to hold his uh, kind of, hold his place until he could go all the way back down to St. Thomas. And he would use a different name. He used Captain Thomas, for example, as an alias. Um, he changed the name of the Revenge to the Royal James. And eventually uh, the Royal James or the Revenge needed to be careened. Careening basically means that um, you have small barnacles or holes in your ship or things that need to be fixed. So Bonnet took a couple of ships into the Cape Fear River and uh, his ship was leaking badly. And he basically took the wood from one ship, turned his ship to the side and, and tried to repair it. It was here in late August that reports of, of pirate ships in the Cape Fear River reached South Carolina. And Governor Johnson ordered Colonel William Rhett um, on an operation to go destroy this pirate threat. Now Rhett would reach the Cape Fear River in September of 1718. And he, he uh, spotted Bonnet and his, and his men. Bonnet and Rhett would engage in a huge naval battle uh, called the Battle of the Cape Fear. And I'd encourage you uh, to, to, to read more about it. It's fascinating. All three ships would become uh, landlocked, run aground on a sandbar. Bonnet's ship uh, would have clear sh shooting, um, a, a clear kind of shooting angle where he can continue to shoot against um, Colonel William Rhett's ship. And after the naval battle, Bonnet decided he was going to try to make his way um, toward the sea. Once the, the tide rose, the, the two British sloops, uh, which were downstream, basically uh, were able to head them off and Bonnet, was, Bonnet surrendered. Bonnet was taken into, um, Bonnet was taken into custody and he was incarcerated in Charlestown. 
And the book describes what I think is one of the best scenes of Bonnet's life. <laughs> he dresses in women's clothing and somehow makes his way out of this makeshift uh, prison that he was kept in. And eventually he was captured again by Colonel William Rett uh, on a small island called Sullivan's Island, which you can still go to today. Bonnet and his men, 33 of them, uh, were held at trial. And what's fascinating and what's, what's included in the book is the full trial transcript um, is still preserved today. In fact, you can read word for word what it was like to be in a, in a pirate's trial. Uh, for me, this was particularly fascinating. Um, and throughout the remainder of his trial um, and leading up to his execution, there was this big swelling of public sympathy for Bonnet. You see young women in particular knew Bonnet was a gentleman, uh, had a liberal education and even Bonnet himself had sought these formal and informal means of avoiding his fate on the gallows. Uh, a proposal was sent and rejected by the governor uh, to release him and to, to ship him to, to England for another trial. And even um, Colonel William Rett, who had just captured Bonnet twice, um, had offered to the king to, to bring Bonnet in for another trial in front of the king. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Governor Johnson of South Carolina relate, remained unpersuaded and Bonnet um, was hung. As was described, approaching the gallows, he had this small group of wilted mm -hmm. flowers, which was symbolic of his own life, uh, according to some historians. Now, Bonnet's life seems to have taken on kind of a, a, a new interest among many. You see, on the day that, I, that the book was released, September 15th, um, HBO announced that they had a series coming out called Our Flag Means Death, which is based loosely on Bonnet's story. Um, the Outlander series has a gentleman named Stephen Bonnet based heavily on Steve Bonnet's character. Um, and even video games like Assassin's Creed shown here on the right hand side of the, of the screen um, have adopted Steve's character um, and, and tell, are telling his story. Now for me, um, you know, as you've seen today, I think it's, it's more clear if you read my book, but it's impossible to talk about Steve Bonnet without telling significant parts of Blackbeard's story. Um, yet history hasn't been kind to Bonnet. He's frequently described as being a little crazy, maybe having a midlife crisis. Commentators describe him frequently as a failure. Um, and I say this all the time, it's, a, it's such a great story and I hope in the book to have done it some justice. And we're still talking about Bonnet. So it couldn't have been, um, you know, his, his legacy is, is cemented somewhat, but through will or money or maybe a lot of luck, Bonnet was able to amass um, almost $5.5 million in today's money in just over a year. Puts him as one of the top 15 highest earning pirates according to Forbes mag magazine. And he sailed with some of the most fearsome men at the time taking on larger vessels. Um, he may have also made a lot of friends along the way, convinced a hundred men to join him uh, he connected with Blackbeard twice, he obtained a pardon and ultimately convinced his captor, not once but twice, to offer to take him to England for purposes of the, of the king's pardon. Uh, he was simply, you know, to, to, to kind of end here, uh, he was an amazing personality with a crazy story um, and is unlike anybody else that you're going to see. Um, with that, I, you know, I think I'd like to, to look at the chat a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the Q&A. Um, I have here some ways that you can keep in touch. If you're interested in the story and would like to talk, um, you know, feel free to go to, to my website, authorjeremymoss.com. Feel free to follow me on Twitter, either my general author account or my Maritime and Piracy account, or shoot me an email. I'd love to hear from you to talk a little bit more about Steve Bonnet uh, or to talk about piracy in general or whatever else might be of interest to you. Um, so with that, Julie, I think I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the Q&A and see what we have. Okay. Right, Jeremy, that's fascinating. Um, I have a question or two, as, as do other people, but are, was the revenge the Queen Anne's revenge? Is that the same ship? No, that's a great question. So uh, the revenge was a frequently used name for pirate ships at the time. Oh. Um, and the revenge itself is not the Queen's Anne's revenge. Okay. So even though Blackbeard did sail on the revenge, um, one of the ships that they took was originally called La Concorde, a big uh, slaving ship. Um, out of Nantes in France. And um, that was eventually what became Queen Anne's Revenge or what was Blackbeard's flagship. Okay. That's the ship that was uh, landed on a sandbar and of, of which is now being excavated as part of the Queen Anne's Revenge project uh, through East Carolina University. Yes, I've been to their um, archeology span lab at, at 
East Carolina. It's fascinating. So I was just curious that I'm definitely now know why the Royal James, one of my favorite watering holes in Beaufort, North Carolina, is called the Royal James. That's right. There you go. <laughs> After that ship. There you go. Um, so we do have a question here. Um, one is asking, I know this talk is focused on Steve Bonnet. However, where did you find information on Blackbeard's The Flying Gang? I have studied Blackbeard and wants to know more. Sure, that's a great question. So The Flying Gang um, really talks about Blackbeard more than Bonnet, predates Bonnet. It includes a, a group of pirates that were led by a gentleman named Benjamin Hornigold. And Hornigold is known to be Blackbeard's um, kind of mentor. And I, I think probably the best resource to start with is a book by Colin Woodard. It's called The Republic of Pirates. I know that there's several chapters that are dedicated to Hornigold and Blackbird, or excuse me, Blackbeard. Um, and that there's a lot of discussion in that book about uh, the flying gang. So I'd encourage you to check out that book, again, A Republic of Pirates. I'd also encourage you to check out Black Flag, Blue Waters, uh, which is another kind of sweeping historical account of piracy in the Caribbean uh, done uh, by Eric J. Dolan, uh, who I know is a friend of the museum as well. So I'd encourage you to check out those two books. Yes, Dolan has spoken about that book for us in our evening lecture series. So That's right. it is a great, great book as well. Um, Sean is asking, your book shows that at trial, Bonnet claimed it wasn't me, but Blackbeard. Bonnet was merely along for the ride. The judge didn't buy it. As an eminent lawyer, do you have any sympathy at all for Bonnet or an easy case closed? It's also popular to see pirates such as the Robin Hoods of the Sea, heroes. Legally, do you feel sympathy for the bonnets and the blackbeards of the golden age? It's a great question from Sean Kingsley, who I know to be uh, from Wreckwatch magazine. I encourage you to check it out. Yeah. It's a great magazine about shipwrecks. Uh, but Sean's questions are great. Um, you're right. Bonnet took what is the classic uh, defense, right? It wasn't me. Um, so the judge didn't buy it. I don't necessarily buy it. Um, there are instances, the only instances of violence, for example, um, were coming not necessarily from Blackbeard, but from one of Bonnet's quartermasters. Um, so I do think that Sean's right to some extent. Um, Bonnet didn't do a whole lot, um, but he did enough. And he, he certainly took over. Uh, there was some piracy that happened after his pardon while he had the Royal James. So I think that there's probably sufficient evidence uh, to have indicted him for that. Now, related to the Robin Hood comment, yeah, I do know that that a lot of folks will look at pirates as Robin Hoods of the sea, right? The taking from the rich and giving to the poor. But in Bonnet's case, you've got the taking from the rich by the rich and keeping it by the rich. So I don't necessarily think it's true. Um, I know that there's a lot of discussion about that and, and whether or not it makes sense. And again, Colin Woodard does a great job of discussing it as well. I've got to be very clear. We're talking about robbers and murderers and seafarers and sea rovers. So I don't know that I have a tremendous amount of sympathy for them um, because many of them did you know, injure others. So even if they were Robin Hoods, I think there's probably better ways to do it. I, I do uh, like the way though, he said when he just had, wanted to get away from his wife, he had a humor to go a pirating. That's right. He's like, I I'll just, I'm just gonna do that today, right? <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm gonna do it today. So. I love that line. Um, Another question, what was the tonnage of the Revenge? Yep, tonnage. Uh, the Revenge was a 60 ton sloop. So not, not huge by any means, but large enough to support the, the crew um, and the, the cannons that it had, so. And James is asking, how is a sloop different than other types of ships and why did pirates use them? Yeah, great, great question from James. Uh, sloops, as I understand them, were kind of low drafted. They could, they could sail through uh, relatively shallow waters. They could shell, sh they could uh, sail relatively quickly. They were fast. Um, they were not overly burdensome. They weren't like a merchantman that was, that was very big. Um, there are some great books out there to talk about the different kinds of ships and I encourage you to check them out. I do, there's probably three or four paragraphs about this particular instance in my book about why the sloop is the perfect pirate ship, but essentially they're fast, easy to maneuver, low drafted um, and uh, easily, easily um, manipulated with with guns and and other things. So, our buddy Sean is asking, what can you tell us about Bonnet's friendship with Anne Bonnie, the woman pirate? 
Yeah, so there's a couple of very famous women pirates. Anne Bonny is one. Um, my understanding is that she probably never met Bonnet. Um, she is well connected to, and in fact, she was um, probably one of the lovers of Calico Jack Rackham. So that story is relatively true as it's told. Uh, but my understanding is that Bonnie never would have met Bonnet. Um, and there's some great books about women pirates too. A Pirate's Life for She, for example, by a friend of mine, Laura Duncombe is great. I encourage you to check that out too. But it, Sean makes a good point. Not all pirates were men. Um, and Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed are two of those that, that show that. That's right. We've had a request for um, the books that you've referenced. If, if, if you could provide that somehow either to us or on your website. Jeremy. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'll do is um, I'll put up a blog post by the end of the day with some recommended reading um, sure. and it'll be based heavily on, on what I recommended today. Okay, cool. Um, Felix is asking, to what extent was Bonnet connected to the pirate round at Nassau? Was he really integrated in the flying gang or did pirates see him as an outsider? Yeah, it's, an, it's another good question. My, my understanding, Felix, is that Bonnet would have been considered an outsider. Right, his, his experience in Nassau was limited really to that initial interaction after you know, attacking that big uh, Spanish man of war and, and meeting Blackbeard for the first time. But I, I, my recollection is that they never really go back into Nassau. So Nassau, a nest of rogues, the Republic of Pirates, um, as Felix alludes to, was really the, the house for everybody. All the, the major pirates of the time would kind of circle around there. And that's what the Black Sails uh, show is based on as well. But the reality is Bonnet would have been an outsider. Um, certainly, certainly would have stood out among them. Um, and even though he was connected to Blackbeard, um, that was really kind of his only connection to Nassau that I'm aware of. Okay. Stephen's asking, are there prominent tales of buried pirate treasure or shipwreck treasure near Virginia Beach area that you might point us to? Huh, that's a great question, Stephen. Um, I don't know that I know of any shipwrecks or pirate treasure. Now, of course, North Carolina, you know, the graveyard of the Atlantic mm -hmm. is well known for having hundreds of them. And there's some really great interactive maps that are available for that. Um, you know, I hate to punt, but I would probably tell you the best person to talk to is John Corstein, you know, the, the emeritus professor um, in, in, at the Mariners Museum, you know, kind of resident historian. Mm -hmm. I'd encourage you to reach out to John and, and talk with him about that. Um, you know, for a cup of tea, I'm sure John would talk for hours with you about it. <laughs> At least hours. That's um, right. John is asking, did you say, and, and I believe you did, that mm -hmm. Teach absconded with the revenge and, and the revenge was not the same as Queen Anne's revenge. So That's right. So we had, and I had to, I rushed through that a little bit, but basically as they floated into North Carolina uh, to get the pardons from Governor Eden, Teach was, or Blackbeard was aboard the Queen Anne's revenge, which is his flagship. And the revenge was still there. And what happened is the Queen Anne's Revenge was grounded um, and eventually left immobile. They never, never got to sail it again. And the revenge stayed in place while Bonnet took a smaller ship to Governor Eden's house in, in Bath, North Carolina. Now, what happened is Blackbeard took all of the materials from the revenge and left the revenge in place. So he took the treasury, took the, uh, took the goods, took a lot of provisions, sails, rigging, gunpowder, et cetera, but left the revenge in place. So it was the revenge that Bonnet later renamed the Royal James um, that was left there. And, and Blackbeard actually took a different ship as he sailed around, taking a more circuitous way, eventually to get a, a pardon as well from Governor Eden. Mary asked, was there any evidence of women in the crew of either Bonnet or Teach? And did a woman named Mary Ann Blythe appear in any of your research? Uh -huh. Uh, working backwards, no, I'm, I'm not familiar with the name Marianne Blythe. Um, I'm going to make a note of it because it sounds like an interesting story to follow up on. Uh, but as far as I could tell, there were no women that sailed with Bonnet in particular. Unlike others, um, Bonnet, there's no stories of him, you know, kind of philandering or being with women very often. Blackbeard, on the other hand, there's, <laughs> there's myths of him having something like 14 wives, including right. marrying a 13-year-old daughter of a governor. Um, but Bonnet, you know, despite his, his marital state, uh, never appeared to, to have women on board or women in his presence. So I didn't see any, but it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a question. Explain Pieces of Eight. Yeah, that's a good one. So Piece of Eight uh, is simply the name of a gold coin. Um, and it's, um, 
you know, it's, it's basically the denomination of the gold coin that's used. So. And didn't they break them up to, I think that they could, that's right. They could separate them um, oh. and give each one kind of a shill. That's so. what I had thought I had read. That's right. Um, I think we've captured the questions. We, we do want you to know that, that you can contact us at the museum and what and watch our blogs i think there's one more slide is there jeremy sure yeah let me pull and, that uh, back up thank you just put that information up we have blogs and our youtube channel obviously and um how to how to buy our books um so we would love for you to support the museum through amazon.com or through jeremy's website which you've already shown that have you not jeremy i have yep author jeremy moss.com that's right and and you do have an ebook correct yeah absolutely so in fact just for today and julie thanks for mentioning that uh, we've dropped the price of the ebook specifically for today to 99 cents so that anybody that was here or, or not on this lecture uh, could go pick up a copy of that just ask that you, you know, hopefully you enjoy it it's a great story and I hope to have done it justice can't can't beat that absolutely Yep. Um, and so I, I wanted to thank thank Jeremy and thank Carrie today for for bringing us into the 21st century with offering interpretation for those that that need it. Um, I want to tell you about a couple of upcoming lectures on uh, Thursday, February 4th at 7 p.m. We will start our evening lecture series and it will be about the Underground Railroad and Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander from Norfolk State University will be sharing stories of those that used the port of Norfolk during the period of, of Civil War and pre-Civil War to escape freedom um, through the waterways around Hampton Roads. That's at seven o'clock. And then Friday the 12th, uh, John Corstein, whom Jeremy mentioned, will be talking at noon on a Virginia and George Washington and the canals, most importantly, the Dismal Swamp Canal, which, which is a fascinating tale as well. So we appreciate all of you being with us. Um, I have to show you my flag today, my Jolly Roger. There you go, the Blackbeard's flag, that's great. I, I love my flag and, and pirates, and I know that all of us enjoyed your talk, Jeremy, and thank you so much for being with us. Um, thanks for all the great questions, and we hope you'll join us again soon. So thanks to all. Thank you all. Bye-bye.